So Parshas Vayishlach, in the outset at least, documents the meeting, the faithful meeting of Yaakov and Esav. It begins with Yaakov Avinu sending messengers to Esav, and that's a story in and of itself. Who were those messengers? What was their message? The methodology that Yaakov Avinu employed of the thrice, a, 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 a triple approach, triplicate approach, where he had diplomacy and prayer, as well as a, a preparedness for warfare. And that lands us on the night before, the night before everything goes down. So chapter 32 and verse 24, the Torah tells us that in his final preparation, Yaakov brought his family across a small river, which is known as the Yabok River. And that night before, in verse 23, we hear about him taking his family and bringing them. They cross the river, they go across the Yabok <laughs> ford. And in verse 24, we hear the exact details of how Yaakov Avinu brings them across the ford. He takes them, he brings them over, over this, this uh, river, the stream. So Rashi says, what is the meaning of he takes them and he brings them over to the other side. Actually, actually doesn't comment, but um, Ramban really comments in detail and he says, the first thing was that Yaakov himself went into the river and whether it was chest deep or whatever, but he was standing in the river and this way he passed everybody over the river. Yaakov himself went to the river first to see if there was danger. When he saw that he was able to stand in the river, the stream wasn't too, too strong, there was no, no surprises. Yaakov passed everybody over the river, literally carried everybody across the river. Like the uh, Divri Davids and the Taz explains in detail, he says, Yaakov went into the water, stood in the middle, and made himself like a bridge. So he was here in the middle, and he was passing the people from one side to the other side. It was a narrow river. It wasn't a, wasn't a wide, perhaps raging, but not a very wide body of water. And that basically is how Rashi explains it. Now, the Pasuk says, Esa Sher Loi. After he, whatever was his. So after he had brought his family across, as it says in verse 23, then we learn that he brought everything that was his, which is Habahema of Hamatautlan. It was a very busy night. We, we learned Yaakov had, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of animals. He had to bring everything across the river. I guess the river is going to be his last line of defense. Okay, so he went onto, onto the other side of the river where Esav was coming. He brings all the animals and also Atzme Kegesher. He made himself like a bridge. In other words, he's like, like we just said in the name of the Taz, he stood in the middle, Venaitul Mikan, Omenyech Khan. He would take from one side and he would place on the other side. Which brings us up to one of the most shocking verses in the entire Torah. After he brought everything across, like Ramban says, first of all, he brought across his family, Ban of Noshov. His children, his wives brought them across. Then Vayaver es Kal Shaloi. Then he brought everything that he owned across. So everybody crossed the river. And then what happened? Verse 25, Vayivoser Yaakov Levadoi. Father Jacob was left all alone. He had a huge family. By any standards, a very big family. He had, he, had, he had servants, he had assistants, employees, enormous amount of livestock. But in the end, Yaakov was left alone. And when he was left alone, something very fateful occurred. By Yeovek Ishimai, he was attacked, blindsided, blindsided, and a man wrestled with him Ad Alois Hashacha until day broke. So all night long Yaakov was left alone, and all night long Yaakov wrestled. What does this mean when we say Vayivasa Yaakov Avade? How did he end up getting left alone? He was surrounded by so many people. He, was, he, had, he had so much, he was busy with so much. So Rashi tells us that the reason that Yaakov was left alone was Shochach Pachim Ktanim. He left behind a couple of small things. And therefore, after everybody had crossed the river, and everybody was safe, and everybody was secure, Yaakov said, I'm going to go back and get the last couple of things that I didn't bring yet. It sounds like a cheapskate. That's really what it sounds like. I, I'm only saying that because I'm going to explain it otherwise later, but that's very strange. He has to go back to the little things. Send somebody else. Forget about the little things. Why would you be alone? Put yourself in danger at night in a scary position. But that's what Yaakov does. He goes back all alone for a couple of small things. And it seems it was not a good idea because when he goes back, that's when he gets attacked. 
this dark, mysterious figure suddenly attacks him, and it's not <coughs> simple. All night long, Yaakov wrestles. Vayavik <coughs> Ishimai, Rashi says, what does it mean, Vayavik? So he says, Menachem Pirish, Menachem was a, a known linguist, and a person who had put something called the Machberes together, the notebook, which is at that time an invaluable aid to biblical study because it went through grammar, biblical grammar, and explained biblical grammar in a manner that was really unprecedented. And Rashi often leans on his scholarship. So Rashi says, if you take a look at Menachem's Machberes, it says over there, Vayis Aper Ish. Vayis Aper Ish means Miloshen Ovak. Vayis Aper comes from the word Ofer. So it's almost like they wrestled. We're going to translate it as wrestling, but the etymology of the word here is connected to, to dust. Meloshan Ovak, from the term dust. Why? Shahayimailim Ofer Bragleim. They kicked up a storm. I mean, people say people kick up a storm when it's a dusty area and people has a lot of movement. It kicks up a lot of dust. It's, a, it's like a euphemism even in English. People say he kicked up some dust. He made, it, he made, it, he made a tumult. Ayadei na'anu'am, through the wrestling maneuvers, so to speak, and throwing each other hither and thither, right? They were, they were, it, was, it was serious wrestling. It's like the, like the stuff you see on television, like throwing them up, throwing them down. It's like body slamming because, because it's, it's, it's kicked up a lot of dust. Valinir, Rashi says, even though he feels compelled to bring the words of Menachem and say that this is called a wrestling match because of all the dust they kicked up, but Valinere, to me it seems, Shahu Lashen Vayiskasher, that it comes from the term they became, so to speak, connected. They, they, they locked horns, as they say. They, 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 were, they were linked. And they were like inextricably linked. They were like pulling each other, pushing each other. But the, the wrestling was that they were, it was like an embrace, but it's not a friendly embrace. But that's to me, Vayiskasher, they were connected together. Lashen it's, Aramihu, it's, it's actually. Rashi says, we can see this shows up in, in, in the Aramit language, which is not Hebrew, but is etymologically similar. And we see that in the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Mesechet Sanhedrin, on page 63, it says, Basar da Aviku Bey. So after they had connected, become connected to him, so you see that the idea of Aviku means connected. And similarly, we see it in the Gemara Menachas that speaks about the knot of Tzitzis. Va'ovik lei meibak. Ba'avikle mevak means that tzitzis were, they were, were tied on, fastened. So they were fastened together or tied on together. Shekein derech, this is the way, shnayim shemis amtsim, two people who are each one trying to overpower the other. Lahapil ishes one throws the other. But when one throws the other, wrestling is not a distance sport. Wrestling is very, very up close and personal. You're dealing with when people wrestle, they embrace, if you will, not exactly in a friendly way. They're, they're grappling. So there's a grappling and there's a, there's, they're very, very in close quarters and very close contact. That's the nature of wrestling. It's literally hand-to-hand, -hand, grabbing each other, grappling with each other. Each one trying to throw the other down with his hands. Uper Shura Baisenuzal, Rashi now adds, who was this dark man? Who was this phantom? Rashi says, our rabbis tell us, and this is from the Bereshis Rabba, Shahu Sare Shal Esav, that this was the spiritual alter ego of Esav, the brother of Yaakov. We know that Yaakov was hated by his brother Esav. We know they had wrestled, so to speak, for a very, very long time, for decades. And here, their conflict and their wrestling came to a head. And Esau wanted to kill Yaakov. Now his spiritual alter ego, or his malach, if you will, his angel, his, his ministering reality from on high, now came to finish the job. And this was then a physical incarnation of the dispute that Yaakov Avinu had with his brother all the years. Now it became actualized in the flesh. And Yaakov physically, actually argues with this phantom, with this angelic creature, that represents the force of Esav. And that's, and that's how we understand it. Now, from learning Rashi, it seems very, very clear that he takes this literally, that there was actually, they were kicking up dust, there was actually a wrestling match, that this is not only metaphoric, this is not like you say sometimes people struggle with mental illness or struggle with depression or struggle with sadness 
or struggle with melancholy, or struggle with temptation. With, with people could struggle with all these things, and it very much feels like a, a wrestling match. And sometimes people get done in, you know, people who are addicted to substances that destroy their lives and they have to wrestle with it. So Yaakov is wrestling over here, but the wrestling here is quite literal. According to Rashi, the word Vayisovek means kicking up dust, grappling. It's, it's like a graphic description of, of, a, of, of, a, of a wrestling match. That's how Rashi basically conveys it to us. And Ramban says it has to be so. And the proof is because in the morning Yaakov was limping. If this was all theoretical, if it was all in his mind, in his heart, if it was, a, it was a wrestling of spirit, then why would he be physically damaged? Why would he be limping in the morning? However, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that many of the Pashtunim understand this verse to be entirely metaphorical. That Yaakov, this was a, 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 a dream, if you will, it was like a prophecy. It was Yaakov was in a, in a, in a, in a, in a non-physical, non-tangible state. And this, this, this theoretical wrestling, where Yaakov wrestles with Sarah Shlesev, with the spirit and idea and ideal of Esav. And he does so all night. This is how the Ralbag, Gersanides, Ram, Rambam, Maimonides, Radak, Abar Benel, and some of the other Rishayim, they all say this was Bechalom, Belebe Metzias. This was in a dream, this was in a, a theoretical state, not in an actual state. Now you tell a person who's struggling with depression that it's not actual. It's nothing, it's some thoughts, like just throw them away. <laughs> He's him sugar. The, the, these, this kind of wrestling, you know, the Robin Williams didn't make it from that kind of wrestling. And, and, and other people like that. So it's not, it's not a little thing. And they wrestled it's in big. the womb. Huh? And they, wrestled they wrestled in the womb, but that was literal. That was quite literal, right? And that caused Rivka tremendous pain, right? Yaakov and Esau were wrestling from the beginning. From the beginning, always wrestling. There was, always, there was never peace there. Always each one trying to overcome the other. But the question is, is this is physical or literal? Or, or, or this is beyond the physical, it's something which is much larger, looms much larger than, than, than the technical and the tangible. But ultimately, I mean, like, listen, you have the shenom like this, the shenom like that. Rashi seems to tell us in Shuta Shal Mikra, from the way Rashi describes it, it would have to be literal. And Ramban very, very clearly ratifies that. And he speaks very sharply about a, a different approach. He says, Chas V'Shalom, to say this otherwise makes no sense. There was physical harm. This had to be a physical thing. Yaakov was physically left alone, not metaphorically or theoretically left alone. But there are two schools of thought. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you there's two schools of thought. I, I, I wouldn't be you know, teaching Torah properly. The bottom line is Yaakov did remain there. And Yaakov did go through some kind of major experience. This is so major an experience that we commemorate it until this very day with the laws of Kashras. Now Yaakov, who had stood, so to speak, on the other side of the river to make sure that everybody else, everybody else got across, so according to Rabbeinu Bechaya, that's how he got left alone. Rabbeinu Bechaya doesn't even go into this business of going back for small things. He seems to have a different understanding of Yaakov being in the middle of the river. Rabbeinu Bechaya seems to think that Yaakov stood on one side and he passed everybody over to the other side. So because he was on one side, passing everybody over to the other, or like maybe throwing everybody over to the other side, then at the end, after everybody was transferred to the other side, Yaakov was left on this side all by himself, which is it's a little hard to understand. It doesn't fit with the idea of Asa Atzmei Gesher, which, which comes from Chazal, and, and that means Yaakov was in the middle. So if he was in the middle, he wasn't really alone. So if he wasn't alone, how did he end up on the other side? And that's where Rashi goes to this idea that he went back to get some little things. Now the Rashbam says that an angel was sent from heaven to prevent Yaakov from running away from Esav. That Yaakov did what any normal person would do. He wanted to run from confrontation. Confrontation is never, ever comfortable or convenient. Everybody wants to avoid it. Yaakov wanted to run away. And he says that's the way the Be- Rajbam explains that's why he went across the river. He was trying to avoid this. In fact, Yaakov his whole life wanted to avoid the confrontation. Esav was a violent, aggressive, in your face, impossible to deal with person. So Yaakov tried to avoid it. He dodged the raindrops. He just ignored him. He stayed out of his way. And then when it came to a head, he did what he had to do. And, ya- and Esav wanted to kill him. Yaakov didn't say, I'll meet you for a shootout. He ran away for a long time. And now Esav's coming to get him. And Yaakov is not happy about this. But he has to confront this. He has to get over it. He has to wrestle it through and get over it. So Rajbam says, Yaakov tried to go across the river. And a Malach was sent to stop him. Nothing doing. You will see Yaakov. You have the strength. Yes, you can do this. Stand and stand your ground and fight, your, fight for yourself. Rabbeinu B'chaya says, this is the Tsar of Esav. Esav wanted the confrontation. The Malach of Esav forced this. 
The Malach of Esau said, we're going to fight this out once and for all. We'll see if Yaakov comes out on top. And therefore, that Malach that was, was actualized. The Bein also goes on to say that it's Malach Gavriel. He suggests it's Malach Gavriel. How that fits with Malach of Esau, I'm not sure, but that's what, he sees, that's what he says. He says, this is, in other words, the, the inner discipline, the inner strength, represent the idea of Gvura. This was a, a, a Gvura or a judgment against Yaakov. He won't stay his ground. He won't fight it out. And, and so it gets forced, and he does. And he does, and he fights, and he fights, and he does it till the morning, he wrestles till the morning. And in the end, Yaakov is victorious. In verse 26, we see the angel cannot do Yaakov in, and so he needs an escape mechanism, and he dislocates his thigh, his hip, and in doing so, he tries to escape. And Yaakov still doesn't let him go. He's got him in a vice grip, and the angel says, send me, I have to go sing my songs, I gotta go back to my angelic reality. Yaakov says, not so fast. Not, not, you're not going anywhere until you bless me. When you bless me, then you can go. And so the angel is not happy about it, but in the end he does. He says, what's your name? Your name is Yaakov. And here is the first time the name you saw. And the angel's like, God's going to give you the name anyway. We know you, you are. Okay, you win. Yaakov says, no, no, no. That's not good enough. You're going to proclaim me Yisrael. And he does. Now, this, this battle, according to, let's say, the, the Sefer Achinuch, this represents the struggle of the Jewish people throughout their exile. This is much, much larger than a lonely night. This is much larger than Yaakov being in danger. This is a major event in what we're going to call Jewish history. But at any rate, I want to talk about this idea of Yaakov's aloneness. How he ended up alone. So on one hand, let's go to the Burem book, page Kufi Tess on the bottom, Simon Tezayin, chapter 16 of the commentary on this parsha. So we have on one hand this idea of Yaakov being alone. And why is he alone? You know what Rashi just told us. But how about this? The Bereshis Rabba says, Ma Kadesh Baruch Hu, Kosuv Bey. Just like God, it says about God, Veniska Vashem Levadei, in the Yeshayahu Hanavi, Isaiah, in the very second chapter of his prophecies, he speaks about the future, when Mashiach will come, and he says, Veniska Vashem Levadei, God will be alone, so to speak. God will be raised, glorified, and alone. Af Yaakov, Vayivasa Yaakov Levadei. So the, the measure seems to indicate that this wrestling match was a messianic of messianic proportion. And just like God was alone, Yaakov was alone. It's an exalted state. It's a very lofty thing. But on the other hand, in the Gemara, which is found in Masechet Chulun on page 91 that speaks about the prohibition of eating the sciatic nerve, the Gemara there says, Nishtayer al pachim tanim. Yaakov stayed behind to collect the last couple of little things. And the Gemara says something which sounds very strange. If an anti-Semite would say this, you would accuse him of uh, anti-Semitism. It says, Mikan tzadikim mm-hmm. From here you see that for tzadikim, for righteous, truly righteous Jews, they're more worried about their money than they are about their physical welfare. This sounds like the canard of Jews are cheap. It sounds so strange. What in heaven is the Gemara talking about, first of all? But here, the, the way the Rebbe frames it, the Gemara seems to be in a dispute, a very, very severe dispute with the Medrash. The Medrash interprets the words of Yaakov's aloneness as being ele- exalted, elevated, achieving an extraordinary spiritual state. And the Gemara seems to interpret it as Yaakov being petty. Either he was exalted, which means transcendent of all the small stuff, rises above it all, the Niska of Levada, like God is Levada, it's like the highest level, the apex of, of spiritual achievement to transcend everything, go beyond everything. On the other hand, it's like the, the greatest pettiness, risking his life, putting himself in danger for a couple of small things. But which is it? The Pashtas, Shnei Pirush Melu, you know, straightforwardly speaking, these two interpretations are minugodim zelazeh. They contradict each other. Lachlutin, they're entirely contradictory. Lafia Medrash, according to the words of the Medrash, Metayra Kosov, as Yankev Bedagan, Eilus we have a description of Yaakov achieving extraordinarily high levels. Which is in the image of nothing less than the final days of human history as we know it. When Mashiach will come. That's how lofty, that's how incredible, that's how great and high this, this, this event was. As it says, In that day, God will be alone. According to the, what the Talmud says, Yaakov is on the other side of the river. 
He doesn't, and Rashi follows this in Pshut Hashem Mikra. He doesn't follow the idea of Rabbeinu Bachaya that he, he just there was, you know, technically he left Brother but the other side of the river, so he got stuck on the first side. <laughs> he went back. He went back, Rashi says. That doesn't make sense because he was in the middle. Also, he made himself like a Gesher. So he went back to the middle. He went back for pettiness. This is the ultimate pettiness. Yaakov the petty. He went back for Pachim Tanim, for little things that have a very little value. The Torah itself calls them little things. So here we have the beautiful interpretations and illumination and explanation of Chassidus, which when you look at things through the lenses of Chassidus, everything becomes clear. It's like seeing the Torah in HD. If you want to get drilled down to the bottom, or peel away all the layers, you want to understand what's really going on here? The truth is not only are these two interpretations not contradictory, but in fact, they are complementary. And they, 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 they buttress one another and ultimately say one and the same thing. Now, that, that sounds strange. <laughs> How could that be? How could a state of exaltedness, a state of lofty transcendence, be one with a state of pettiness? So the Rebbe explains it like this. Habal Shem Tov Mefarish. The Baal Shem Tov explains, and this is found in Keser Shem Tov, entry 218, it says like this. <laughs> The reason we make such a strange statement about tzaddikim obsessing over dollars and cents, being so petty about, about things of value, because in the money or residuals or possessions of a yid, yeshnam nitsutsin kadishin, there are holy sparks. This is the idea of tikkun olam that everybody talks about and has no idea what they're talking about. Talk about fixing the world. Fixing the world ultimately is a Lurianic idea. And let, let's set aside the perversion of it to, to become some liberal ideology. Mm-hmm. It's a Torah idea which means that before creation there was another world and that world collapsed and there was sparks embedded and those sparks are now found throughout the strata of existence and that when we live our lives in a holy fashion we're able to redeem and redirect those sparks and that fixes the world, that fixes reality so to speak. That perfects reality. So there's this idea of these holy sparks that have to be elevated. Who is supposed to elevate holy sparks? The answer is everybody. How do you know which sparks are yours? The answer is whatever you own is yours. We believe in Hashgach HaPratis. So if divine design ordained it, that you should own something, that something comes your way, then it's your sparks. And if they're your sparks, your job is to elevate them. And if you drop the ball or say, I don't want to fight for this, well, let somebody else take it. I can't be bothered. Then ultimately, it's not just a question of you're not standing up for your rights. It's not just an issue of you're not taking what's rightfully yours. Ultimately, it's an issue of shirking your duty and making this world a perfect place. You're not doing your part in putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. There's this gigantic jigsaw puzzle with billions of pieces. Every one of us is given a certain amount of pieces, put those pieces in place. In fact, we understand from a Hasidic perspective why theft is such an evil thing. Because when you steal, you're literally destroying God's plan. God's plan is that this person should elevate that money, which means those sparks. And by stealing, you're meddling in what God ordained. It's a, it's a, it's a sin of cosmic proportion. So the Baal Shem Tev says, because these represent the sparks that are connected to every Yid's Neshama, a Yid has the sacred duty of elevating those sparks. And because a Yid has the sacred duty of elevating those sparks, if he ignores them, he's not ignoring little things. He's not letting, leaving money aside. What's he leaving aside? He's leaving aside the sparks he has to elevate. He's shirking his responsibility. According to the rule, whatever starts off loftier, the lower something is, or the less valuable something is, petty stuff. That's the nature of this world. The things that seem most petty are actually most valuable. Ah, now we understand why Yaakov was so worried about the little stuff. Because don't sweat the small stuff. Sweat the small stuff. It's the small stuff in which everything is contained. Because when you engage with that, you're able to to crystallize, to purify, to, to, to extract those sparks and to restore them from the place that they are hidden or embedded into. As it says in the words, teachings of Kabbalah, especially in the Sefer Ma'eri'er. Ella, the thing is like this. 
in order to be successful in this mission. To get to the sparks that are in the lowest strata, the lowest possible reality. Oh, you need special strength. You need incredible ability, an infusion of power, Ma'akadosh Baruch to go so low, to lift things so high. Shalafanov, in for before that power in Hevdol ben Adagas Hagveres Lenuchusis, you need to get to a place where the lowest and the highest are irrelevant. That's how high it is. It's it's the great equalizer. It's beyond highs and lows, beyond that, so to speak, that scale. V'lachain need meyankev it seemed to yankev at that at that moment. He was, he was metaphorized or likened like Kaddish Baruch Hu, as the Niske Hashem Levade. He's in the highest levels of redemption. He's the highest levels of messianic perfection to be able to go back to elevate those little sparks. To get those sparks in the smallest, most insignificant, most petty and seemingly valueless things. For this you need the highest Kayach. And so the highs and the lows actually meet. It's like that circle at the very end touches the very beginning. It's the highest power that is needed to elevate that which falls lowest. And that's how we are able to balance beautifully the Medrash and the Gemara. They're actually not a contradiction. In fact, they're mutually complementary. And ultimately, this sheds light on the idea of what Yaakov was worried about, why Rashi takes it as Peshut HaShemikah, besides it being the simplest, most straightforward way. Within it is contained the incredible secrets of creation and the mission and purpose of nothing short of life itself. So now we're up to the Pachim Ketanen. Now we're in the lowest level. We're dealing with the smallest reality. <laughs> and therefore we must be sure that Hashem gives us the greatest Koyach. And hopefully very, very soon this wrestling match will end and the sun will rise with the coming of Mashiach. Memheder will be Amen. Amen.